Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, where we take up important articles of the day from the newspaper and discuss them in detail as per the demands of civil services exam. Articles covered today are displayed on your screen and their notes in PDF and Word format are provided in the description box down below. Without further ado, let us begin. Now starting off with the first article of the day and it appeared in page 12 of today's Hindu newspaper. In this article, the Prime Minister of India, he has hailed the launch of Chandrayaan 3 mission in his monthly radio broadcast called Man Ki Baat. Further, the Prime Minister, he also noted the involvement of women scientists and engineers in our country's space program. As these women, they have handled many important responsibilities, right from being project director to project manager of different systems of our country's space program. Now, this article in general, it highlights the increasing role of women in science, technology, engineering and managerial roles in our country. However, this stands in stark contrast to a largely held image of less women participation in STEM sectors. As according to World Economic Forum, female students and employees, they are underrepresented in STEM sectors. As in schools, most female students would rather pursue arts rather than subjects like mathematics and engineering. And this phenomena is called as STEM gender gap. Now, World Bank data, it shows that globally that there are about 18% of girls in tertiary education who are pursuing STEM studies as against 35% of boys. Hence, there is a need for more women in STEM sector which will further the innovation and will better represent the needs of our Indian society. Hence, tapping the potential of women in STEM sector, it will help in bridging gender inequality by providing a level playing field for them in fields of research and development. Further, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal and it is SDG 5 that highlights the issue of gender equality, which includes women's use of enabling technology such as information and communication technology as a means of achieving economic empowerment and greater agency. Now this topic, it is important from GS Paper 1 perspective, which highlights role of women in Indian society. Further, a similar question, it appeared in mains of the year 2019 which asked us about continued challenge that women in India, they face. Further, women protection measures, they are also important from prelims point of view, which is apparent from last year's PYQ on Janani Suraksha Yojana. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion on women in STEM sectors, we will first discuss factors that perpetuate the STEM gender gap, following which, we will discuss initiatives that are primarily taken by government of India in order to further the participation of women in these STEM sectors. Also, before concluding today's discussion, we will also take a look at way ahead which will further initiate measures that can be undertaken in order to reduce this STEM gender gap. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion by discussing what are the factors that perpetuate gender STEM gaps. Now there are many factors that further STEM gender gap. Now the first factor that is perpetuating this STEM gender gap is called patriarchal conditioning. As this patriarchal conditioning, it is responsible to mold our family's thinking towards societal norms. And this means that household responsibilities and childbirth, they are seen majorly as a women's role. And this means that women, they need to back out of their professional careers in order to undertake household and child responsibilities. Further, these patriarchal attitude, they also go towards in awarding grants, fellowship and hiring practices in professional environment, thereby disincentivizing women for participation in professional sphere. Further, there are also gender stereotypes that affect women's participation. For example, STEM field, 
it is often viewed as masculine and teachers and parents they often underestimate the girls maths abilities hence these women they are then forced to undertake courses which are different from stem sectors further there is also another cause that perpetuate stem gender gap and this is called a dual role syndrome and this means women who are participant in stem sectors they are likely to face a dual role wherein their professional decision they are largely affected by their domestic responsibilities for example many women they prefer to withdraw from research field after their marriages and childbirth and this means that women's participation it gradually decreases as their age increases further women also face discrimination at their workplaces as women in stem sectors they face gender biases in performance evaluation which is primarily due to lack of women representation in leadership roles additionally there has also been lack of supportive infrastructure which means that there are lack of suitable workplace or educational benefits such as travel allowance lodging and maternity benefits which negatively affects women from pursuing careers in stem sectors in the end women they also have fewer role models as girls they have fewer role models which will then inspire their interest in stem fields further there are also limited examples of female scientists and engineers in books medias and popular culture hence all these six factors they further perpetuate the stem gender gap in our country now after we have discussed the factors let us take a look at initiatives that the government of india has undertaken in order to promote participation of women in stem sectors the first initiative in this regard is the vigyan jyoti scheme and this scheme it was launched by department of science and technology in order to create a level playing field for meritorious girls in high schools in order to encourage them to pursue stem in their higher education the second initiative in this regard is known as kiran initiative which is an abbreviation of knowledge involvement research advancement through nurturing this scheme was also brought by department of science and technology and this scheme has been instituted in order to encourage women scientist through various programs in field of science and technology the third initiative in this regard is called gender advancement for transforming institutions also known as gati initiative as this initiative it seeks to bring about institutional reforms in order to facilitate women in science technology engineering medicine and mathematics discipline at all levels in our country further there is also a scheme called consolidation of university research for innovation and excellence or qri scheme and this provides support to women universities in order to improve their r&d facilities further there is also a scheme which is called as biotechnology career advancement and reorientation program also known as biocare scheme and this scheme it was undertaken by department of biotechnology for career development of employed and unemployed women scientist up to 45 years of age and it provides first extramural research grant to these women also there is an annual event called she stem event and this event it celebrates women in stem sector and this event it was organized by embassy of sweden in india atal innovation mission niti ayog as well as german center for innovation and research now after we have looked at initiatives by government of india for furthering participation of women in stem sectors let us look at way ahead for furthering the participation of women in these stem sectors the first suggestion in this regard it pertains to closing of confidence gap among women and in this regard employee resource groups such as women forum or working parents connection they can play a valuable role 
as they will provide tools for women to feel confident about their STEM careers. Also, there is an imperative need to address gender biases in learning material. For example, providing biographies of women who have succeeded in male-dominated fields such as space and science sector can alter the career aspiration of young girls and it will further encourage them to participate in STEM sectors. Also, there is a need to provide paternity leave for males in STEM sectors. As childcare leave, it should be extended to male parents as well. And this will prevent women from bearing the entire burden of childbirth to child rearing activities. Also, there is a need to extend incentives such as age relaxation in eligibility criteria for research work as well as providing public funding for crash facilities, on-campus housing, safe transport and medical help as it will act as an incentive not only to attract but also to retain women in STEM sectors. Further, there is a need to encourage partnership with private sectors. As private sector, it can play a crucial role in bringing financial support to non-profit STEM initiatives. Also important in this regard is Gender Inclusion Fund. As this fund, it has been proposed by National Education Policy of the year 2020. And this fund, it implements provisions which are critical for improving access to education for all women. And this fund, it can be used for early investment in reskilling and promotion of STEM education among women. Hence, from this news article, we can see that increasing number of women in STEM sector, it indicates that the situation in our country is gradually improving. However, various socio-economic hurdles it needs to be overcome in order to utilize the women potential at their best. And this can be done by closing confidence gap, addressing biases in learning material, granting paternity leave to male employees, Extending incentives to further promote participation of women, encouraging partnership with private sector and furthering the gender inclusion fund is important for increasing participation of women in STEM sectors. Hence, this was all for today's discussion in women in STEM sector. Now moving on to the second article of the day which appeared on page 2 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now this article, it highlights the vulnerability that migrants face in different socio-political environment. Now the issue of migrant workers, it was also at the forefront during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was when millions of migrant workers, they travelled on foot to reach their destinations in face of uncertainty. Now the census, it categorizes migrant as a person who resides in a place other than his place of birth or the one who has changed his or her usual place of residence to another place. The census of the year 2011, it estimated around 450 million internal migrants in India. Further, economic survey of the year 2017, it estimated that there are about 139 million seasonal or circular migrants in our country. And these migrants, they dominate low-paying, hazardous and informal market jobs in key sectors of our economy. Further, these seasonal or circular migrants, they have a markedly different labor market experience and they face integration challenges which are more than permanent migrants. However, precise data and systematic accounting of their experiences, they are currently unavailable. Now the issue of internal migration, it is important from GS paper 1 perspective, which highlights population and its associated issues. Further, in GS paper 2 syllabus, it mentions welfare scheme for vulnerable section and population by center and states. And migrant workers, they constitute a vulnerable section in our Indian society. Further, a related question, it appeared in mains of the year 2015, where it asked us to discuss the changes in trends 
of labor migration in the last four decades. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion on internal migration, we will first identify reasons for internal migration in our country. Further, we will also discuss issues that are affecting internal migrants in our country, followed by interventions that are taken by various state and central government in order to alleviate the problems of our internal migrant workers. Further, before concluding today's discussion, we will also take a look at way ahead that will address what else measures that can be undertaken towards welfare of migrant workers in our country. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion with reasons for internal migration. The primary reason that affects the migration pattern in a country are economic reasons. There are two factors that determine economic reasons. The first is a pull factor. Pull factor signifies that the attractiveness of more developed area pulls the migrant away from their homes towards these developed areas. As developed areas have better opportunities for employment, also there are higher wages when you get employed in more developed areas. Also, these areas offer better amenities, hence these are the reasons why migrant labors are attracted towards developed areas. The second reason are push factors. These factors pushes a migrant away from their home because of certain reasons. F the first is that in less developed areas, the primary source of employment is agriculture. However, this is faced with lower level of incomes. Hence, persons who want higher income, they shift away from these underdeveloped areas. Also, in less developed areas, per capita availability of land is low, which makes farming a non-remunerative economic activity. Also, there are lack of basic facilities such as housing, sanitation and infrastructure which pushes migrants away. Also, less developed areas have fewer opportunities for employment. Hence, a larger section of the population remains unemployment. Also, less developed areas have fewer alternate source of income and hence due to non-availability of income sources, a migrant is pushed away from these non-developed areas. Further, there are socio-cultural factors as well, which include cultural and entertainment activities which are available in urban areas. These act as a source of attraction for migrant workers. Further, in developed areas, the migrant workers has a less probability to face caste-based discrimination. Also, there are family conflicts in less developed areas which forces a person to migrate to another place. Also, due to improved communication facilities, it has acted as a source of attraction for migrants that in case they live away from their homes, these communication facilities will enable them to keep in contact with their family members who live away from their place of work. Also, Better developed areas offer improved education opportunities and these act as a source of attraction for migrant workers. There are other factors as well, such as political instability is less in developed areas and these areas also have a better law and order situation, which favors the development of economic activities in these areas. Now, that we have dealt with the reasons that affect migration in our country. Let us take a look at issues that internal migrants in our country face. The first issue that internal migrants face is that of non-portability of entitlements for migrant workers. And it is further aggravated due to absence of identity documents with migrant workforce. Also, there is an absence of reliable data and this is because lack of realistic statistical account with the government of the number of migrant workers and lack of understanding of the nature of migrant workers mobility. Further, a large portion of migrants, they hail from marginalized groups such as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. And this adds an additional layer of vulnerability to their urban experiences. 
Further, these migrant workers face exploitation at the hands of their employers and contractors, which are in form of non-payment of wages, physical abuse and accidents. And the existing legal machinery is not sensitive to the nature of legal disputes in the unorganized sector. Further, there are lack of access to education for the children of migrant workers. And these aggravates the intergenerational transmission of poverty in India. Further, there are lack of housing infrastructure in a country, which means that there are greater pressures to accommodate more people in urban areas. Hence, these migrant workers are forced to live in slums. Further, these migrant workers, they face social exclusion as the local language and culture of urban areas are different from their original culture and hence they face harassment at the hands of local people. Also, there is an impact on health of migrant workers in a country because factors such as patterns of mobility and poor work and living condition, they negatively impact the health condition of migrant workers. Also, migrant workers in a country face lack of political participation in the area of their employment. As interstate migrants, they cannot exercise their voting rights because voting in India is determined by one's inclusion in the local constituency's electoral role. And the process of enrolling is time-consuming and has no relevance for seasonal migrants. Thereby, they face exclusion from political participation. However, the government of India and state governments have undertaken several interventions in order to make the lives of migrant workers better. What are these interventions? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first and most important intervention by the government was that of One Nation and One Ration Card Scheme, which ensures the distribution of highly subsidized food grain through a nationwide portability of ration cards and the operationalization of biometric authenticated point of sale transactions at and state levels. Also, this is a Pradhan Mantri Shram Yogi Mandhan scheme, which ensures protection for old age and social security for unorganized sector workers. Also, government has made efforts to educate the children of migrant workers. For example, the project Changathi of state of Kerala, which is implemented as a literacy scheme to target the migrant children so that they can learn the language of Malayalam. Also, the government of India introduced the Ayushman Bharat scheme, which was launched in the year of 2018, which is fully financed by the government. The benefits of this scheme are portable across the country, which means a beneficiary can visit any impaneled public or private hospital in India and avail a cashless treatment. Further, the government introduced the Garib Kalyan Rozgar Abhyan, which aims to boost employment and livelihood opportunities for migrant workers who return to villages in wake of COVID-19 pandemic. It involves skill mapping of migrant workers and it linked women with self-help groups. Further, there are few legislative measures as well. These include the Interstate Migrant Workmen Act of year 1979, the Building and Other Construction Workers Act of the year 1996, and the Code of Social Security of the year 2020, which has few provisions for interstate migrants. Now, what can be further done to improve the welfare of migrant workers in India? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first measure includes the need for coherent legal and policy framework on migration, as there is a need to mainstream migration in a comprehensive and focused manner in policy documents and national development plans. This can be achieved through design of targeted components and special outreach strategies for migrants within the public service and government programs. Also, there is a need to ensure ground-level implementation, which can be done 
by prioritizing the implementation of existing labor laws. Further, there is a need to sensitize and train the policy makers, local government officials, NGOs, employers and financial institutions regarding the obstacles that the migrant face in accessing of public service. Additionally, there is a need to fill knowledge and research gaps as this will enable the evidence-based policy making in a country. These include revising the design of census and surveys to adequately capture age disaggregated data on migration patterns in a country. Further, there is a need to conduct detailed countrywide mapping of internal migration. Further, there is a need to improve the institutional preparedness and build capacity of these institutions. This can be done by building capacity of panchayats which will maintain the database of migrant workers and it will help establish vigilant committees to identify the entry of new migrants at local levels. Further, by establishing migrant labor cells in each state, it will help support the labor ministry of the central government. Also, there is a need to create inter-district and interstate coordination committees which will jointly plan institutional arrangements between administrative jurisdictions of sending and receiving areas to ensure proper service delivery to migrant workers. In the end, there is a need to devise a universal national minimum social security package for migrant workers, which will include complete portability in terms of registration as well as premium which will be paid by government on behalf of migrant workers. Hence, to conclude, we can say that since migration has a cross-cutting sectoral impacts, multiple and complementary interventions by different ministries and departments are needed, which will facilitate the migration and ensure that migrants are integrated into economic, social, political and cultural life of our nation. This is all for today's discussion on internal migration. Now moving on to the third article of the day which appeared on page 6 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now this article, it highlights the fact that India, it does not have a domestic law or a consistent policies on issue of refugees or asylum seekers. Further, India is also not a signatory of 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol. Hence, refugees, they are seen as an illegal migrants and are often lumped together with other foreigners under the Foreigners Act of the year 1946. As this act, it provides unchecked executive powers against foreigners and contains no exceptions for vulnerable population such as asylum seekers and refugees. Hence, this issue, it is important from GS Paper 2 perspective, which highlights bilateral, regional and global groupings as well as agreements which involves India or affects India's interest. Further, the issue of refugee crisis, it also has an impact on security management in our country's border areas. Hence, this topic is also important from GS Paper 3 perspective. Further, in the means of the year 2014, a question directly appeared on how illegal transborder migration it poses a security threat to India. Further, the issue of citizenship and domicile, it also appeared in prelims of the year 2021. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion on refugee crisis, we will first take a look at India's refugee policy or rather lack of a refugee policy. Additionally, we will also discuss the reasons that India has given for not signing the 1951 Refugee Convention or its 1967 Protocol. Then, we will discuss the need for a uniform policy so in order to manage the refugee population in a better manner. Further, we will also discuss challenges that India might eventually face in case it decides to bring out a uniform policy on refugees. Hence, 
Let us start off our today's discussion by discussing what is India's approach towards refugees. India's approach towards refugees, it is characterized by absence of a specific legislation, which will enable India to address the refugee challenges. Now, this lack of specific refugee legislation in India has led the government to adopt what is called an ad hoc approach. And hence, the status of refugees in India, it is governed mainly by political and administrative decisions rather than a codified code of conduct. Hence, the legal status of refugees in India, it is governed mainly by two legislation. The first is Foreigners Act of the year 1946 and the second is Citizens Act of the year 1955. However, these acts, they do not distinguish refugees and they apply to all non-citizens in an equal manner. Now, the existing Foreigners Act of 1946, it has failed to adequately address the unique issues that are faced by refugees as a distinct group. Additionally, this act also grants an unrestricted authority to the central government to deport any foreign citizen. Further, the ad hoc nature of government's approach, it has led to varying treatment of different refugees group. For example, the Citizenship Act of 1955, it was last amended in the year of 2019. And this amendment, it aims to grant citizenship only to immigrants from Bangladesh Pakistan as well as Afghanistan who belong to Hindu, Christian, Jain, Parsi, Sikh and Buddhist communities as these communities they have faced persecution in their home countries. Further, the Supreme Court of India, it ruled in the case of National Human Rights Commission versus State of Arunachal Pradesh in the year of 1996 as this ruling it affirmed as there are certain rights which are available to Indian citizens as well as foreign individuals which includes refugees as they, they are entitled to right of equality and right to life among other fundamental rights. Hence in this regard, there is a need for India to bring out a uniform refugee policy. Now after we have discussed India's refugee policy, let us take a look at reasons that India has given for not signing the 1951 United Nations Refugee Convention on status of refugees as well as its 1967 protocol. Now there are several reasons for India not signing the 1951 Refugee Convention as well as 1967 protocol. The first among which is the security concerns that are associated with refugee population. As India currently, it shares porous borders with neighboring countries such as Myanmar and Bangladesh. And these countries, they are subjected to conflicts or unrest inside their domestic territory. And these unrest, it can lead to large scale displacement of population into India. And this potential influx of refugees, it could disrupt the delicate regional demography in the Indian society. Further, India also hosts a large number of existing refugee population. As India, it currently has a significant number of refugees which include Tibetans, Sri Lankan Tamils, Rohingya Muslims and population from African countries. Further, signing of a refugee convention would also impinge on India's sovereignty and it will invite international scrutiny on India's domestic policy as joining the convention would subject India to internal scrutiny which can be related to internal security, political stability as well as international relations. Further, the reasons for not signing the convention are also related to India's past experiences which has led to a serious distrust. As during the Bangladesh Liberation War in the year 1971, India faced a massive influx of refugees without any substantial international support or financial aid. And this, it has led to skepticism about the effectiveness on UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Further, these convention and protocol, they subscribe to a narrow definition of refugees. 
as the definition in these conventions of refugee, they may not align with India's perspective on refugee issues. For example, the convention, it does not include economic deprivation as an eligibility criteria for refugee status. As India, it wants to include economic deprivation as an eligibility criteria for granting refugee status. Hence, this article highlights that there is a need for a uniform refugee policy by the Indian government. Now let us discuss why is there a need for refugee policy in the next slide. Now the demand for uniform refugee policy, it stems from many reasons. The first is that due to absence of a uniform policy, the government, it currently considers refugee request on a case by case basis. And this leads to lengthy and time consuming process for granting approval for refugees in our country. Further, India aspires to be a global leader and hence it is necessary to have a refugee policy in place which will enhance the goodwill of India among the committee of nations. Further, a uniform refugee policy will enable India to better deal with humanitarian crisis such as that of issues in Balochistan as India would currently get support from other leaders to fight for humanitarian causes. It will also enable India to deal with Pakistan in a strategic manner. Also, compiling India's ad hoc approach into a uniform law, it will project India in a positive manner in the international arena, which will work wonders to enhance our country's soft power. Further, a uniform refugee policy will enable India to complement its peacekeeping efforts, which has made a substantial ground in conflict-bound areas such as Africa. Now, after we have discussed the need for a uniform refugee policy, let us discuss the associated challenge that may be associated with a uniform refugee policy. The first challenge, it pertains to borders of our Indian nation. As borders in South Asia, they are currently extremely porous and any conflict which can result in mass movement of people, it will lead to a significant strain on our local infrastructure and resources. And further, it will also upset the nation's delicate demographic balance. Further, signing such a convention would mean that India will be bound by law not to repatriate even a single refugee against their will which is sometimes necessary to deal with a political crisis. Also, giving shelters to every refugee may create new problems such as that of human trafficking, drug trafficking as well as abuse as it will require additional financial as well as administrative burden on the Indian state apparatus. Hence, India has already faced a surge of refugees and it has dealt with the matter to a large extent possible without even having a formal policy. And in this context, a lot needs to be done in order to widen the ambit of India's refugee policy so that it can cover all refugee related cases in a comprehensive manner. Hence, there is a need to develop balance between human rights and human obligations on one hand and national security and national interest on another hand. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on India's refugee policy. Now moving on to the last article of the day which appeared in page 9 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now this article highlights that the Apple company, it has endorsed a legislation which will allow users repair their phones at a third party shops. An Apple company says that the bill in its current form would benefit users and protect them from their privacy and security. Now the right to repair movement has been in news in the recent past. And this topic is important from GS Paper 3 perspective which deals with environment and biodiversity as well as conservation, environmental pollution and degradation. Further, a similar question, it appeared in mains of the year 2018 and it asked us impediments 
in disposing huge quantities of discarded solid wastes. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion, we will first discuss the need for right to repair in India. Then, we will discuss challenges with respect to its implementation in Indian context as well as a suggestive way forward which will highlight the measures that are needed to bring right to repair in reality. Hence, let us start off our today's discussion by discussing why is there a need for right to repair. Now, an electronic company, it currently does not favor repair by other entities. Hence, commonly, these company, they limit access to tools and components or they put up software barriers which prevents independent repair or modification of their electronic products. And this obliges the customer to only use the proprietary services that are offered by the company. And in this regard, right to repair becomes very important as it is a framework which enables the consumers to repair their electronic goods at their own preferences. Now you will ask, why is there a need for a right to repair? There are multiple reasons for it. The first reason is that a right to repair, it provides consumers with enhanced choices. As consumers, they can decide where and how to get their products repaired. And this will eventually enable them to save time as well as money which are related to their repairing expenses. Further, right to repair will also help reduce the enormous amount of e-waste that are generated every year due to consumers preferring to buy new products and disposing their old products. Further, right to repair, it also acts as a boost for small repair shops and this will enable the Indian government to increase self-employment opportunities in an Indian economic setup. Further, right to repair also encourages the principle of reuse, upgrade and recyclability. And this, in long term, it enables the sustainable consumption of electronic products. And this is in line with the life principle, which enables lifestyle supportive of the environment. Further, right to repair, it also promotes circular economy as it defers the practice of planned obsolescence which are practiced by certain manufacturers. As these devices, they are designed specifically to last only a limited amount of time and they eventually needs to be replaced. Whereas right to repair, it promotes the right to repair your own devices and hence only a certain components it will be changed Whereas important components, they will be recycled into repairing of old devices. Hence, it in a way promotes circular economy. However, right to repair, it brings with it several implementation challenges. What are these challenges? Let us take a look in the next slide. Now, the first implementation challenges that are associated with right to repair is the cost to the government's exchequer. As most small repair shops currently, they are unorganized in setup. Whereas promoting such small repair shops will invariably reduce the tax inflow towards the government. And this in long term will reduce the revenue income of the government of India. Further, there are also issues related to lack of awareness as the consumers currently they are unaware of their right in most cases and they are obliged to the instructions that are given to them by the manufacturers. Further, there are also issues that are related to quality of third party spares as there is no effective mechanisms currently to test the quality of third party shares and there are fears that these spares they might falter soon. Thereby, consumers are apprehensive to move towards these third party spare parts. Also, in a way we can say that the right to repair, it inhibits innovation. As the process, it might inhibit the innovation in many fields and the manufacturing company, which will then reduce their R&D expenses in order to make devices 
मोर मॉड्यूलर इन नेचर फर्दर देर आर ऑल्सो फेयर्स दैट यूज ऑफ थर्ड पार्टी स्पेयर पार्ट कैन कॉज डैमेजेस टू द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक गुड्स एज ओवर रिलायंस ऑन थर्ड पार्टी एंड स्मॉल सर्विस सेंटर्स विदाउट परटेनिंग टू मिनिमम स्टैंडर्ड्स ऑफ क्वालिटी इट माइट डैमेज द प्रोडक्ट एंड ऑल्सो माइट कॉज हार्म टू द यूजर्स Now after we have discussed the implementation challenges let us take a look at suggestive way forward in this regard of right to repair Now in order to make the right to repair a reality there is a need to bridge the quality gaps that exist between manufacturers as well as third party service providers as where a manufacturing company might themselves may share specific standards in which their products they need to be repaired This will enable third party service providers to effectively repair a electronic product. Further, there is also a need to create awareness among consumers as they need not to pay extra to use a company's product and it is their right to ask for spare and services for products that they might have purchased from another company. Further important in this regard is the skilling of human resources as there is a need to match the demand of repairing the products away from authorized company centers hence by bridging the quality gaps that exist between manufacturers as well as third party service providers creating awareness among consumers as well as skilling the human resources will enable an economy to realize the right to repair hence this was all for today's discussion on right to repair